July 29th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Galatians, Chapter 2 from the New Testament. Then after fourteen years I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas, taking Titus along too. I went there because of a revelation and presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so only in a private meeting with the influential people, to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, although he was a Greek. Now this matter arose because of the false brothers with false pretenses who slipped in unnoticed to spy on our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus to make us slaves. But we did not surrender to them, even for a moment, in order that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were influential, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God shows no favoritism between people. These influential leaders added nothing to my message. On the contrary, when they saw that I was entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter was to the circumcised, for he who empowered Peter for his apostleship to the circumcised also empowered me for my apostleship to the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who had a reputation as pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship agreeing that we would go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. They requested only that we remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he had clearly done wrong. Until certain people came from James, he had been eating with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he stopped doing this and separated himself because he was afraid of those who were pro-circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also joined with him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray with them by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not behaving consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, If you, although you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that no one is justified by the works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by the faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ we ourselves have also been found to be sinners, is Christ then the one who encourages sin? Absolutely not. But if I build up again those things I once destroyed, I demonstrate that I am the one who breaks God's law. For through the law I died to the law, so that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside God's grace, because if righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. God, I don't want to diminish the powerful message of what is said in this chapter by Paul, that we are justified by the faithfulness of you, and not by the works of the law, not by works that we do. None of us can be justified. It is only by your faithfulness, the death of Jesus Christ for our sins. I don't want to diminish that, but there's something that caught my attention when I was reading this that kind of caught my heart. When Paul is talking to Cephas, or Peter, as many of us know him by, um, and he's chastising him for eating with the Jewish Christians and making the Gentile Christians uncomfortable because they were they were feeling like second-class citizens that only if they would abide by all the the laws of being Jewish could they be considered a full Jewish Gentile Christian <laughs> if that makes sense God but he was he was making somebody feel as a second rate a secondary citizen and, and yet there's nothing we can do 
to be justified by you. That's what Paul's talking about. So no matter what we eat or don't eat, circumcision, non-circumcision, that was Paul's whole point, is is no longer this uh, dedication and honor to the law, but understanding that <laughs> that we are justified by the faithfulness of your son, Jesus Christ, for dying on the cross for our sins. But in that process, I think of Peter making somebody feel like a second class citizen by doing something that was religious. And then I think about what we do, that we make other people feel secondary or less than through our religiousness. I know since since I do marketing online that I have to be careful about when I create websites for churches, I have to be careful about using Christian ease or church ease or religious ease uh, vocabulary. Because just because we use it within the church doesn't mean that those outside the church who need to hear these messages understand what in the world we are talking about. I noticed this with uh, some friends of mine that just came to visit who obviously go to a different church than I do. And I could easily pick up in their in their words that they spoke to me exactly their matching vocabulary that came from their church. Um, it's almost like being in a clique where you have certain words that make sense to you, certain vocabulary that you use. And, and I'm not saying the vocabulary is bad by any means, obviously. Um, but what we do is is exactly what Cephas or Peter was doing in this case. We make other people feel less by almost speaking this kind of secret language. It's not that the words are secret. It's just this kind of inner sanctum language of the church that those on the outside don't know. Now, I don't know about you who are listening. <laughs> God knows. Um, when I was in school, I was picked on. I was bullied. I was a geek and that wasn't acceptable at the time and I was made to feel like an outsider. Uh, they knew the right clothes to wear, the right guys to date, the right words to say and they had their whole own little inner sanctum. Not that I wanted to join them but I definitely felt like an outsider because I didn't have that knowledge and it was something that they were using. I think sometimes God that we do that same thing in church. Um, we get into this comfortableness, this kind of click idea, um, and we do certain things that excludes the outside. And I'm not just talking our vocabulary. There's other things that we do as well. Um, I had a friend who just went to the church for a first time, and my church actually has open doors for the service. It has greeters, a couple of different greeters at the front door for any new people coming in, as well as the regular people. It has free coffee and tea and hot chocolate and kind of places to, to mingle and talk before going into service. So very, very welcoming church. I'm very blessed with my church. But my friend just went to a church and there wasn't that at the beginning. Um, walk up and there's, there's closed doors. Uh, you pay for your coffee inside at a coffee bar. Um, just all these little things that that may feel some may make feel somebody on the outside feel really uncomfortable, especially coming to your church for the first time. Or if you sit down and talk to somebody um, because they're starting to ask questions about God, going full bore and laying out the whole gospel right in front of them <laughs> and preaching to them. God, I know is not the right way to reach these people. So I think even though obviously the main message of this chapter is all about uh, justification uh, by your faithfulness, not by our works, uh, there is a secondary message that we've got to be really careful about what we do and what we get comfortable with in our Christian cliques um, and what makes sense to us and what doesn't make sense to the outside. Um, understanding that that words we use, actions we use, uh, processes we use, um, even even certain images that we use online may make perfect sense to us on the inside, inside the walls. But God, they, they may not make sense to anybody on the outside of the walls and may stop them from coming inside the walls so that we can get to know them. 
God, I, I simply bring this up because I'm, I'm incredibly guilty of this, of having a certain type of vocabulary. I'm comfortable speaking with my, my church friends um, and realizing that when I get into conversations with my non-Christian friends, that they stop me a lot and say, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I think we need to be very hyper aware of making sure that we're not being like Cephas or Peter and excluding people. Although I think his was based upon upon ego a little bit maybe ours is also I'm you won't you know God um, that maybe we like being in that clique but but let us be very aware of the words we use the actions we use uh, how we talk to people who may not understand the language that that we have in our church circle um, God, I, I thank you for your word today I thank you for sharing with us not only the primary message of the wonderfulness of being justified by your faithfulness and not by the works of the law, but also all these other things that are going on that we should obviously pay attention to as your children. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <music>